I'm going to talk to you about the Oak Bay case. But frankly, as a, a, the case on its own, it has, has very little legal significance at all. But I think a very important case seen in the context of the bigger puzzle of which it forms part. One of the features of the case, though, that uh, endears it to the heart of every lawyer is that there were 25 advocates in the case and as many attorneys or more. So upwards of, of 50 lawyers in a case, which is lovely for the legal profession. <laughs> I acted for the governor of the Reserve Bank in the case, and the governor was merely a respondent, and he kept a low-key role in the case. So I was not one of the main actors. I don't take credit for any of it. I also don't take blame for, for any of it. I'm, a, I'm an innocent bystander in the case, one of those 25 advocates in the crowd. When one considers the, the context, the bigger puzzle, the other parts of the puzzle, then it is important to just point to a few of those features. One very obvious part is the turmoil in the management of our economy that we're in. We, and it has various components to it. We have seen this revolving door of ministers of justice being hired and fired um, in quick succession. There was Nene Gate, there was Van Royen for a weekend, <laughs> there was Minister Pravin Gordon reappointed, and more recently Minister Kigaba taking his place. We don't really know, we think, we, we suspect we know what the reasons are for all of these appointments and dismissals, but we're not sure. One thing we do know for sure is that the Explanations put up by the president are not true, but that is as much as, as we know. For the rest, we're left to speculate as to why these things happened. We do know that Minister Gordon was appointed uh, much to the resentment of the president and not because he wanted it. In the middle of all of that, the, the quick succession of ministers of finance, we have a, a completely spurious attempt to prosecute uh, Minister Pravin Gordon. Uh, I was far more intimately involved in that case, and I can tell you that it was an utterly spurious attempt. There was no foundation for it in law or in fact. And even if all the facts were true, uh, there was no case in law. So it was a completely spurious attempt to prosecute him. Something, another piece of the puzzle that one could only speculate had an explanation elsewhere. It was certainly not in any grounded suspicion that any crime had been committed by him. Then there's the extraordinary revelation by Deputy Minister Jonas that the Guptas offered him the job as uh, Minister of Finance, and an offer which came with uh, an offer of a, a bribe of 600 million rands deposited anywhere in the world, as long as you, quote, work with us. And that offer was said to have been made in the presence of the president's son. Of course, the president's son and the Guptas deny it, but frankly, Mr. Jonas is a man of stature and credibility, and you can decide which version to accept. Then there are the, the accusations of capture of SARS in the first place, fueled in the last few days by the KPMG confession that the report they furnished, which so significantly contributed to that change of guard at, the, at SARS, was an unfounded report. And I can tell you from the bit that I know, is that the, the, when the report spoke of this investigative unit inside SARS as a rogue unit, as if it was unlawfully set up, there was again absolutely no legal foundation for it at all. Um, the, we don't need to go into the technicalities, but that characterization which so drove the whole purge at SARS was false at its very core. There was nothing unlawful about the creation of that unit. They may have acted unlawfully at times, and I'm not, I don't express any view on that score, but the creation of the unit for which Minister Gordon was blamed was completely legal from the outset, and there was nothing unlawful about it. Coupled with that is the so-called capture of some of the state-owned entities, ESCOM, Transnet, uh, 
uh, SAA and others. The economic management of our country and complete turmoil and seemingly the battleground of good and evil. Apart from this economic, macroeconomic management and the turmoil in it, there came the bizarre report of the public protector. Frankly, I can't explain it. I don't know what the explanation is. I don't know how it works. I know very little about the public protector. I knew her predecessor well, an extraordinary woman and a heroine of the whole country. Came her successor and uh, she brings out this very, very bizarre report. Firstly, recommend, not recommending, directing, ordering parliament to amend the constitution. Amend what part of the constitution? The mandate of the Reserve Bank, an innocuous mandate, a mandate that says that it's their task to protect the value of the currency. Why would a public protector insist that the Reserve Bank shouldn't have a constitutional mandate of protecting the currency? Does it mean that nobody should protect the currency? It seems as if one tries to make any sense of it, is that the public protector has it against the discipline exercised by the Reserve Bank in protecting the currency. But the public protector didn't explain herself, so one doesn't really know what lies behind that very bizarre uh, order which she never sought to defend. And then secondly, an order that she makes on the Reserve Bank that it sues APSA for compensation for the lifeboat granted to uh, APSA's predecessor in the 80s and 90s. Now, I know nothing about the merits of that claim. But what I do know is that the government had appointed uh, Judge Davis, a commission chaired by Judge Davis, to investigate and make a recommendation as to whether there was any claim. And he had concluded that there was none. And that even if there had been a claim at the, at the outset, that claim had prescribed. The public protector doesn't engage with those findings and simply orders the Reserve Bank to sue APSA for some compensation. Inexplicable, uh, but another manifestation, another instance of seeming government aggression towards the banks. There is another feature of the puzzle before we get to the Oak Bay story, which, is which has not been highlighted and which might be worth mentioning, and that's this. And that is that the banks have increasingly uh, played uh, a more and more important role in combating money laundering Money laundering, which is very closely associated to lots of other criminal activities, including corruption. And let me explain why that is so. Because I believe that it is that role of the banks that led to the, their blow up with the Guptas, and that's this. It starts with um, an international body called the Financial Action Task Force, FAFT. It was set up by the G7 countries at their summit in Paris in 1989. And its purpose is to protect the global financial system against money laundering, because money laundering was recognized as a scourge of the global financial system, money laundering which underpins a great deal of crime, drugs, uh, smuggling, uh, corruption, all sorts of crimes. So it was recognized that it was important for the financial institutions across the world to cooperate and to, to, uh, to fight money laundering. The mandate of this task force was broadened after 9-11 to extend also to financing of terrorism. And, what, uh, and, and the task force today has 37 members, of which South Africa is one. It is a policy-making body and its members have undertaken to one another, in other words, we are all obliged at, at international law to implement those undertakings. The task force has published so far some 40 recommendations which comprise a complete framework of measures to combat money laundering. And that framework has been implemented by almost 200 countries, not only the members of the task force, but almost 200 countries, including South Africa.
the main piece of legislation by which this framework has been implemented in South Africa is the Financial Intelligence Center Act, FICA, 38 of 2001. And there are two parts to FICA which is of relevance to our story. There is the part that has always been there since 2001. And what that part does is to impose significant duties on the banks to get to know their clients and to, to monitor their clients' financial transactions. Not only the banks, it's called uh, all accountable institutions. But of those accountable institutions, the banks are the most prominent players. They are required to, get, to make sure that they know their clients. Um, they have to keep an eye on their clients' financial transactions. And if there are suspicious transactions, then they are obliged to report those transactions to the Financial Intelligence Center, FIC. It, in turn, has powers of investigation and intervention if it, uh, if it comes across suspicious transactions. So what this legislation means is that it is no longer permissible for the banks to look away when their clients engage in suspicious activities. They are made to bear responsibility for what their clients do. And uh, at, uh, up to a point, they are, well, at a point, they are required to distance themselves from their clients if the clients persist with their nefarious and suspicious activities. That's the first part of the, of the act, of FICA. There is a second part, and that is the part that was recently introduced only this year by the amendment to FICA. You'll remember the amendment that President Zuma was so uh, reluctant to sign. It took a lot of pressure and a lot of threats of litigation um, because Mr. Manyi had persuaded him not to sign the legislation, and it was sent back to Parliament, and only eventually was it signed. Now, this amendment that the president was so reluctant to sign introduces another feature also on the advice of the International Task Force, and that is this. Banks are now required to identify those clients which are called in the South African terms prominent influential persons, PIPs, PIPs. The international term for, the same, for exactly the same thing is a PEP, that's a politically exposed person. But what that means is that the banks are required to identify the PIPs or the PEPs clients who either hold or have held um, prominent public positions. Because the task force recognizes that powerful people, people who have held public office, or who hold or have held public office, have a greater capacity and a vulnerability for money laundering. Not that one suspects them to be guilty, but they are generally the people who, have, who are vulnerable to bribery and who have the power and the means to commit money laundering. So what this amendment does is that it obliges the banks to identify those clients who are prominent influential persons, but, and then in, those, in the case of those clients, to, to be particularly vigilant in monitoring their transactions. It includes not only those prominent people, but also their immediate family, and then also all entities that provide goods and services to those public bodies. So it would also include the Guptas as providers of goods and services to government. So what this legislation does in effect is to say to the banks, you must identify people like our politicians, their family, and the people with whom they do business like the Guptas, and pay particular attention and report to us if they engage in any any uh, suspicious activity. So you can understand that the banks these days are not the friends of people in high places, particularly people in high places engaged in nefarious activity would resent the fact that the banks now have to monitor their activities. That brings us to the Oak Bay case, because 
I believe that the Oak Bay case really happened because of a blow up between the banks and the Guptas, precisely because the banks are now obliged to take some responsibility for the conduct of their clients. The Oak Bay case, in turn, really is, uh, comprises three stories which are intertwined. I'll call them stories A, B, and C, because not all three stories featured in the case, but I think all three stories played in on one another. The first story, story A, is the story about the clash between the Guptas and the banks, because the banks closed the Guptas' accounts. That's story A. But then there is story B, and this is really story B that formed the subject matter of the case. Story B was the story of the Guptas, who through their uh, chief executive officer of Oak Bay, Mr. Hawa, attempted to persuade and intimidate the government regulators to intercede on their behalf, to intercede with the banks, really to intimidate the banks. They put pressure by, by writing letters and making public statements. They attempted to pressurize the Minister of Finance, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, and the Registrar of Banks, who is a functionary of the Reserve Bank, to get them to intercede on their behalf with the banks. Now, they did so by, as I say, by writing letters, by making public statements to put pressure on these people. And you remember those statements that said, if you don't do this, the business is going to go under 5,000 people or 15,000 people are going to lose their jobs and so on. So public pressure was put on these regulators to intercede with the banks on behalf of the Guptas. That's story B. Story C is a related story, but a little bit different, and that is the role of some government ministers, and particularly the Minister of Mineral Affairs, Minister Zwane, who aggressively interfered and um, interceded on behalf of the Guptas uh, against the banks. There was said to be a committee of ministers. It was called an interministerial committee, comprising Minister of Mineral Resources, Minister Zwane, the Minister of Labor, Ms. Williphant, and the Minister of Finance, Mr. Proven Gordon. But Mr. Proven Gordon never participated in the activities of the, of the committee. Minister Williphant was also never visible in its activities. So it was apparently Minister Zwane, the Minister of Mineral Affairs, who acted with the hat of the Interministerial Committee and acted very aggressively. Uh, I checked again today to look at some of the statements he made at the time. Very, very aggressive statements. Came out guns blazing against the banks and threatened them with all sorts of things. You'll remember one of the things he did was to announce that Cabinet had approved uh, the appointment of a Judicial Commission of Inquiry to inquire into the conduct of the banks. And he suggested that what they will do is to amend the law to bring the banks to heel, to subject them to the control of the Minister of Finance. And he also threatened that, there, that new licenses might be granted. And he never was explicit in this regard, but suggested that they will be got at through their licensing. So there was this story C, the aggressive intervention by some government ministers, and particularly Minister Zwani. Now, the chronology of that story unfolded as follows. There was firstly, in December 2015, there was Nene Gate and the appointment of Mr. Proven Gordon as, or the reappointment of Mr. Proven Gordon as Minister of Finance, much to the resentment of the President. I have no doubt that since then, the President resented the fact that he was forced to reappoint and it was, a, it was a hugely humiliating experience as well for him to fire Nene for a false reason, appoint Van Royen, only to be forced to reappoint, to change his mind and to reappoint uh, Minister Proven Gordon. As it happens in that same month, APSA gave notice to uh, the Gupta companies that it was terminating its relationship with them and declared that it would no longer be prepared to act as their banker 
And after APSA had done so, the other banks followed. And um, the Gupta companies came under much pressure because they can't do business with, uh, without a bank. The Gupta companies then, through Mr. Hawa, started putting pressure on the regulators, the Minister of Finance, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, and the Registrar of Banks, to intercede on their behalf. He, he wrote letters to them from April 2016. They had a meeting with Treasury where they put their case. And um, in all of those interactions, the regulators, Minister Provin Gordon and the other regulators, made it clear to the Guptas that they couldn't intercede on their behalf and said to them, if you have a complaint, go to the banking ombud or go to court if you think your rights have been violated, but we can't uh, intercede on your behalf. Mr. Zwane then came out, guns blazing, suggested that the law would be amended, threatened the banks, and really attempted to bully the banks into uh, changing their minds about the Guptas. His, his announcement of a judicial commission of inquiry was, not, was just not true and was repudiated by government. It was then in this scenario that the Minister of Finance, then still Provin Gordon, launched the Oak Bay case in October 2016. And what he did in the case, it was, a, it was a simple application for a declaratory order. What he asked for is an order declaring that he, the Minister of Finance, does not have a power or a duty to intercede with the banks for the benefit of the Guptas. Um, it was a big case. He cited 12 Gupta companies, four banks, the three regulators, the uh, Reserve Bank, the Registrar of Banks, and the Director of the FIC. So it was a big case, but with a little prayer for something which was really trite, and that is that he didn't have the power. And nobody actually ever suggested that he had the power to intercede with the banks. The Guptas were merely trying to bully him to do something that he didn't have the power to do. But that was big case for a little prayer, little claim. And what he also did in the case is he introduced a certificate issued by the FIC to say that the Guptas, that uh, the banks had made 72 suspicious transaction reports to the FIC about the Gupta companies. Not relevant, frankly, to the issue in the case. Whether, whether the Minister of Finance has the power to intervene, seed with the banks or not, uh, has got nothing to do with the 72 um, suspicious transaction reports. But you can understand why he put it in. He put it in <laughs> for everybody to understand that the banks were acting for good and proper reason and not purely because they were malicious. But that was really, so the big issue in the case, or the little issue, but the center of the case was for a declaratory order that he doesn't have the power to intercede with the banks, and he bolstered it by controversially putting in the certificate disclosing the 72 um, suspicious transaction reports. The Gupta's defense, frankly, was pretty predictable, and they said, why a declaratory order? We've never claimed that you have the power. We asked you to intervene, but we never claim that you have the power, and we accept that you don't. So there's nothing in issue between us. We agree that you don't have the power to intercede, but we say you've, this is a political maneuver, and therefore there's no justification for the courts to exercise, uh, to, to issue a, uh, a declaratory order. And what's more, that certificate of yours uh, is irrelevant, and it should be struck out came the judgment in August last year. Now, I believe that one should firstly look at the legal implications of the judgment and then at the political implications of the judgment. Let me just read to you what it said in paragraphs 82 and 83 of its judgment. It says, It is not appropriate for a member of the national executive to draw the judiciary into the exercise of his executive functions as evinced in this application. 
To grant the minister the declaratory relief would allow the judiciary to stray into the exercise of executive functions where the circumstances do not warrant its involvement. We hold a strong view that this application was clearly unnecessary in the circumstances of this case. Such circumstances do not warrant that the court exercise its discretion to grant declaratory relief by pronouncing itself on an undisputed legal question which has previously been confirmed in judgment. Quite stridently critical, what it really says of the uh, Minister of Finance is you know very well that this issue is uncontentious. What you're trying to do is to score a political point by coming to us for a declaratory order, and I'm not going to allow you to do so. As for the fixed certificate, the court said the certificate is irrelevant to your cause of action, and it uh, ruled the certificate to be inadmissible, and it made the Minister of Finance pay for the dispute about the big case and for the dispute about the certificate. So at a legal level, the Minister of Finance lost hands down. What the case did was for immediately to shut down all of this public discourse, putting pressure on the Minister to intercede on behalf of the Guptas, and it put a stop to Mr. Z uh, Minister Zwane's ongoing efforts to intercede on behalf of the Guptas. That firstly ended, not by the judgment, it ended when the case was launched. Because now the issue, i.e. whether government can or should intercede on behalf of the Guptas, that became the subject matter of a pending court case. And tradition has it that people lay off when the matter is before the courts. And the likes of uh, the Minister of Finance could also say, don't pressurize me, the issue is before the courts, the court will decide this issue. And even when the judgment came and the Minister of Finance lost, it was still on the basis that it is so trite that government can't and shouldn't interfere on behalf of the Guptas that I'm not giving you a court order to that effect. But the, despite the fact that the application was dismissed, it was on the basis that as a matter of law, government doesn't have the power and may not interfere with the banks on behalf of the Guptas. At a political level, I believe the case and the judgment did achieve an important outcome, which might have been the minister's purpose all along. Uh, I don't know. So that there was a legal defeat for the minister a measure of political victory by at the same time. However, by the time the judgment was given, Minister Pravin Gordon had been fired. He was fired on the 30th of March, after the hearing of the case and before the judgment was delivered. So in the bigger scheme of things, whether that was a victory or a defeat, uh, we'll have to see. Thank you very much.